Hello. Okay. Yep. This is terrifying. Okay. Whew. Um, I'm going to dive in. There are more people speaking after me and I prepared a lot, so I'm going to move quickly. I am Katie Marcelon. Okay, good. Got my name out there. I work with the city of Eureka and I had the honor and the privilege to work with the Elk River Estuary Enhancement Project. Just quick background. Here's our project location just adjacent the mouth of Humboldt Bay. This was land previously purchased for the um, in the 1980s for the development of the wastewater treatment plant facility that you can see to the north. And between that time and now, the land really wasn't being used for its greatest or best public benefit. So we had this property, this asset that really wasn't being utilized. Uh, the project presented some opportunities for us to improve public access, to expand salt marsh, to create wetland habitat and the water quality benefits that come along with that, to provide climate adaptation in that the Elk River, we know in our seeing our large storm events, our atmospheric rivers, this is potential floodplain feature, right? We're right here at the edge of connection between the river and the bay. So there's that possibility that we could be providing detention area and retention benefits during storm flows. And then to create sea level rise. So the resilience features for us in this setting, we're seeing the larger king tide events and our high tides. Where can we provide inundation areas and then reduce localized flooding in adjacent properties? Uh, here is an overview of high level project goals to create and enhance estuary and intertidal habitat across 114 acres uh, to create 2.8 miles of channel and construct our public access features, a one mile extension of trail, a new trailhead parking facility and a new non motorized boat access point. So how are we going to do all that? We needed to change the topography of the site. So all of the variations of concept design work, final design work was about setting all the elevations within the site. This graphic is showing you red and orange are upland features. There was a large, I don't know if my mouse will work, nope. There was a large um, feature here that is a naturally occurring upland area. And then the, the sections that you see to the west and the east, those were proposed earthen berm features. So we're really just showing these upland features and then everything that's green and blue is our salt marsh. Obviously the project would not have been possible without the tremendous funding. A huge thank you to the State Coastal Conservancy helping us additionally leverage federal grants. Our NICWIC funding was a big partner to us and then um, Ocean Protection Council was another state grant. So jumping into construction, this is a great side-by-side -side that shows before construction, the full site during construction and after construction. Our area one location we describe is north of Elk River. It's about 25 acres. And the goals here were quite simple. Tidal connection, salt marsh habitat, invasive removal. You can see this mass of Spartina spreading across the site and then public access. So big features here, this tide gate would come out with the project work. All the tidal channels would be expanded, widened and changing the topography to create some more diverse habitat here. To be able to do this work, we needed to um, get a little better water control and do the defish work. So Ross Taylor and his team were there with the fish relocation effort, three, maybe four, maybe five days in a row. It was a very long effort. And in September of 2022, this is what the site looked like. So it was a multi-phase removal of the tide gate here. Um, low tide in June, we were able to uh, move fish out, try to get water control at the site in the low tides in July. They actually came in and set the sheet piles here. And so it took multiple rounds for that tide gate removal. And then the other things you see here are Spartina has been top mode. There's some new channels coming in on the west side. So just little progress points. Here's some shots of Spartina eradication from ground view, top mowing, and then tilling under. And there's our area one site uh, about eight to 10 days after a uh, breach. This is at high tide in October. The other thing you're seeing in this photo is a um, boat that's bringing in a sediment boom because we were just about to breach for the area two, the south side of Elk River. So the goals were the same for area two. 
tidal connection, salt marsh, invasive removal, and public access. The difference here is that the existing site conditions are not a low functioning salt marsh. This was agricultural pasture land. It's approximately 89 acres. And then existing at this site was the rail corridor on the west side, and then obviously Highway 101 on the east side. This is a progress photo in July. So I'm going to try to not go over my minutes. Oh, I'm over. Um, the big takeaways here are that, and please come and talk to me more, and I'll have contact information. Regrading 89 acres uh, requires a lot of thought and design and planning. So you can see they're cutting channel, they're building in berms, they're trying to lay out dirt, windrow, reduce moisture content. changes at our site. Our east berm, woo, we chose to make it woo, skinnier. And one of the um, reasons is that at this site, we were seeing a greater consolidation factor. So as we were cutting material and excavating out, we planned for consolidation of 20%, and we were seeing a higher uh, consolidation factor at almost 40%. The other variable was that our LIDAR data and true ground surface was slightly off. So we were lacking the material that we needed to construct our earthen berms. We needed to get those up at elevation to hit all of our topography targets. So in doing this, we quickly had to make these choices this east side berm was proposed at a 16 foot width on the top and approximately 50 feet across the base. We modified that and made it skinnier with a 12 foot top and a two to one side slope. This, we were able to keep 4,000 cubic yards out of this feature and use it for other places. And then um, we actually increased our wetland area because the footprint of the berm was reduced down to 34 feet. The other project modification was that the design team said, hey, you know, you could add additional wetland features at this site and then you could can keep more material for your other upland features. So three ponded features were added to the channel network and those yielded an additional 9,500 cubic yards. So these three ponded features have been tremendous habitat. Um, we have had monitoring out at the site every month. Thank you to Ross Taylor and the fisheries and all of our Aquatic species seem to love these features. And it was able, you know, with that change, quick change in the project, we were able to keep some of these upland features that you're seeing here, these islands, a larger peninsula, and those really created um, what the project goals had intended to create a sediment bench, to create some sloped edges and ecotones. A large number of habitat kind of metrics and data that came out of the project. I'm going to keep going so I don't lose my time here. Up to all the public access features were brought online. And there's our beautiful watery site. So again, I pushed through a lot of information. Thank you. That's the results of construction. All right, and now we have Ross. <laughs> uh, sure, where's the pointer? I'm Ross Taylor. Uh, my goal here is to discuss uh, 10 years of restoration work and five years of monitoring in 10 minutes. <laughs> um, and my company's been involved with the restoration work on Martin Slough for the last uh, six years. Just to give you a quick location of where Martin Slough is, it's kind of right opposite the entrance section of Humboldt Bay. 
It flows into Swain Slough. Swain Slough is the lowermost tributary to the Elk River. Um, Martin Slough has a drainage area of about five and a half square miles and has about seven miles of, uh, of uh, fish bearing channels. Some of the historic impacts to Martin Slough are similar to a lot of the watersheds around the bay. Channel straightening, some urban development, lots of diking and draining down in the lower end for mainly uh, dairy pastures and removal and alteration of the riparian vegetation. Two main features that were uh, a focus of the restoration effort were the old flapper style tide gates down at the mouth of Martin Slough. Um, they were really inefficient in draining stormwater out of Martin Slough. They had four very poor fish passage uh, um, capabilities as far as fish getting into Martin Slough. And then the photo on the right is one of the channels up through the city golf course, basically overgrown with a reed canary grass that reduces channel capacity and also creates um, pretty poor water quality conditions for fish, especially salmonids in the form of a uh, low dissolved oxygen. And this was kind of what the golf course looked like in most winters. Um, it would flood and it would take days or weeks to drain. It makes for very unhappy golfers. And after doing fisheries work on a golf course, you want happy golfers. The first restoration action taken was in 2014 where that tide gate was removed. And what was installed is, is called a muted tide gate, um, which the muted tide gate expresses the full duration of the tide cycle, but lets you control or mute the level of the high tide going on the upstream side of the tide gate. This could be for several purposes. Um, you can grade um, land on the upstream side for certain periods of inundation to restore salt marsh, and you can also limit or prevent the amount of, of brackish water hitting the dairy pastures that are still existing on the um, land trust property or the, or the greens on the golf course. And again, these, uh, the tide gate is adjustable on these um, floats here, and there's a switch so you could do adaptive management if you needed to, to tweak the tide gates in the future. Some early work that was modeling work that was done looking at the proposed salinities with the muted tide gate. As you can see, the red line is the higher salinity. As you go up Martin Slough, the salinity starts to drop, and you can see several of the ponds as you move upstream, the salinities decrease to provide us basically a variety of habitats for fish, be it estuary, marine fish, freshwater fish, or even some amphibians up, up in the upper part of the watershed. So most of this work is occurring on properties in Lower Martin Slough, owned and managed by the, the, the Regional Land Trust, as well as the City of Eureka, which is the golf course. Channel construction started in 2018. There were four summers of construction. This work started at the bottom and worked progressively upstream. Um, just over 6,000 feet of channel was excavated and widened. Um, three new off-channel ponds were constructed. Two of these were on the land trust property and one was on the golf course. And then three existing ponds on the golf course were enhanced. They were dredged and deepened and had multi-log wood structures added to them for habitat complexity. Lots of riparian planting and some channel exclusion fencing was um, um, implemented down on the land trust property. So I started doing the fisheries monitoring in 2019 and our original objectives were just what, what species of fish are utilizing the restored habitat and how are they progressing as each summer's uh, channel excavation worked and the brackish water extended farther upstream. These are nine of 15 different species, fish species that we've documented utilizing Martin Slough. Um, each year that, that the restoration progressed, we saw a uh, greater diversity of the species and certain species we saw apparently them start to really respond positively, mainly um, tidewater gobies up here. Yesterday somebody had some cute pictures of tidewater gobies. We went from catching several dozen of them to hundreds of them to literally thousands of tidewater gobies in Martin Slough. So really positive response by them. So those upper ponds I mentioned, uh, we wanted to maintain some fresh water in them for amphibian um, breeding and rearing. Um, during uh, the fish and amphibian relocation, we captured and moved um, northwestern salamanders, Pacific giant salamanders, rough-skinned newts, red-legged frog, Pacific tree frogs, and even one of the ponds uh, supported a small population of western pond turtles. 
starting in uh, uh, the last two years of monitoring I did, we really wanted to focus in on coho salmon, and this was kind of an extension of what Josh had been doing out at Martin Slough and, and some other places around Humboldt Bay. We wanted to, again, um, dig a little deeper into the growth of the fish, the residency time and certain uh, habitat features that were constructed. And again, looking at that, how are, how are the juvenile coho faring in the off-channel brackish ponds versus the single-thread freshwater channels? Did a lot of, a lot of seine netting, um, both in the, in the connector channels, some of the brackish ponds, the deeper ponds, we used a, a kayak for access. Pretty much all the coho salmon that we captured, we implanted with pit tags. They have a unique identifying number. We put in the small nine millimeter tags and fish down to about 65 millimeters, and then the larger fish got the 12 millimeter tags. That's a hand scanner. Every time we were doing our monthly monitoring, we were doing this from November through June. We'd be out there each month. We'd scan all the coho looking for fish that we had previously tagged that we'd call a recapture event so we can start to assess growth of these fish. And then down on the land trust property, we installed an antenna array system. Those are two 10 by three foot antennas in the water here. And then there's a green box that has a batteries in it that run off the solar panels. Um, there's a receiver and a data logger in the box. If anybody's worked with these systems, they're finicky and fickle, but once you get them running, we were scared to touch anything. It ran good for two years. Um, and it was very challenging, too. This is low tide. At high tide, those antennas would be submerged. And so the antennas are constantly uh, tuning themselves based on the depth of the water and the salinity that can affect the their reading of tags. So just to go through a, some brief results from our monitoring, um, our first season of monitoring was from November of 2021 through June of 2022. Kind of a relatively dry winter, and we didn't really get our hands on a whole lot of fish. We tagged 133 fish, we had 36 recaptures, and we detected 50 of those individual fish down at the antenna array. The next winter was much wetter, um, a lot more fish in the system, 579 tags implanted, 52 recaptures, and interestingly, the proportion of recaps or detections down at the array was similar in both years. Uh, the take home, we already heard this from Josh and Kate, coho grow really fast in the off channel ponds in the brackish water environments. Coming in in the, in the early winter when they're doing that redistribution, now most of these fish are most likely coming down the Elk River, up Swain Slough and into Martin Slough. Um, we had fish 65 to 80 millimeters. By May and June, they've doubled in length and tripled in weight before they out migrate. Um, Number one, just explains how we get our daily growth from recaptures based on previous lengths and weights. Um, Kate touched on this as water temperature increased, growth rates increased. And really down here, take a look at our average growth rate. This is just some fish recaptures between March and April. 0.71 millimeters versus 0.27 millimeters in the freshwater channel. And then in your brackish water, we had 0.22 grams per day of growth versus 0.07. So length, daily length growth was almost twice as high in the, in the brackish off-channel ponds, and weight was almost threefold. In 2022, all of a sudden we got lots of coho fry in the upper freshwater section. Um, we we're, believe this is pretty strong indications of adult coho successfully spawning in Martin Slough, something that hadn't been documented in many years. Um, when you download your antenna array data, you get hundreds and hundreds of lines of code and all these tag detections. And like when you're nerding out on the data, what's really exciting is when you get tags that aren't yours and it's like, where are they from? And luckily we have a great local resource of biologists doing this work. We had four tag detections of fish from uh, Freshwater Creek that ended up in Martin Slough. One of these fish took 11 days to make this 12, 13 mile trip from Freshwater Creek into Martin Slough. Josh showed those really odd-sized fish. One of our freshwater creek fish had left freshwater creek in 2022 as an age one plus, and it hit our antenna array a year later at age two, entering Martin Slough. So go figure. Uh, last slide, we did have one ocean entry detected fish where all my freshwater creek colleagues were like, nope, not my tag. And I think maybe it was Kate or Bob Pagliuca were like, that's a prairie creek fish. This fish had been tagged in October 
of 2022 at 72 millimeters. That's less than three inches long. And it showed up in Martin Slough in April of the following year. So it went on a 38 mile open ocean swim. And the more we put these tags in these fish, the more we're finding how diverse and elastic their life histories are. And, and for me, sometimes it creates more questions than answers. And finally, I just want to acknowledge all the project partners, um, completely collaborative effort from all these different agencies and funders. And for me, most importantly, I want to thank my employees and all the people that came out and volunteered to collect fish, install pit tag antenna arrays. It's muddy work. It's buggy work in the summertime. And when you're on the golf course, you have golfers firing golf balls over your head all day long when you're collecting fish. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ross. <laughs> all right, next up we have Andrea Picard. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. So we've been on Humboldt Bay all day, and I'm going to take us out of Humboldt Bay. Um, Humboldt Bay exists because of the two coastal barriers that enclose it, the North and South Spits, and they have an entire ocean coastline that also is subject to sea level rise impacts and uh, extreme events. So I'm talking a little bit more about that today, and I'm going to give you an update on our... I'm going to try to give you an update on the uh, Wadash Restoration Project. So this is a collaborative project. Um, the two major partners are Redwood Community Action Agency and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We have a number of funders, but the two major ones are uh, Wildlife Conservation Board and the Coastal Conservancy. This is the location of the Wadash unit. It's north of the Lanfear Dunes unit that you might have heard about. Wadash is the um, Wiat word for dune, and our property lies in unceded territory of the Wiat people, and we have involved the tribes in planning and implementing this project. So um, we have a goal of increasing biodiversity, but also um, one of climate resilience. Excuse me. And our funding came from those two programs. This is the Wadash uh, unit as it looks today or looked until a, a couple months ago. It's 300 acres and you can see that it lies on these dune forms, parabolic dunes. All of the vegetation you see except for the um, except for the forested area here, and then these swales in a line along here, it's all invasive vegetation. So our goal was to restore the biodiversity and in so doing, increase the climate resilience. This is a map showing the locations of the different invasive vegetation. So the orange is European beach grass, the yellow is yellow bush lupin scrub, and the light orange is a mixture of European beach grass and yellow bush lupin scrub. This is it from the air. You can see over here the really, oops, that shouldn't have happened there. The really dense, oh, that wasn't the right one though. The really dense um, yellow bush lupin scrub, which continues down along here. There's a few remnant areas of native dune mat. And then a lot of bright green, which are uh, invasive annual grasses that I'll mention in a minute. This is the way dune mat should look. This is at the Lanfear dunes. And you can see that there's a lot of space between plants. The plants aren't, a lot of them aren't actively competing, which allows for greater diversity. In fact, they um, can facilitate each other. And this is the same plant community at the Lanfear Dunes in the summertime, which gives you an idea of the diversity of this plant community, which is called Dune Mat. Now this is yellow bush lupin scrub. A yellow bush lupin was um, planted on the site in the 1950s. It spread, um, you know, unchecked until now. When it's a relatively new invasion or on the earlier stage of the invasion curve, 
you tend to have pure yellow bush lupin like this although you can already see that there's annual grasses in and around the yellow bush lupin scrub that's because yellow bush lupin um, which is a fast growing short-lived shrub so it pumps a lot of nitrogen into the soil it um, enriches the soil in a way that creates secondary invasions by annual grasses and um, together those two things build up a really thick duff layer which is hostile to the um, establishment of native species or chokes out any native species that might be present. Dune plants are adapted to low nutrient situ situations. This is just another view of the, um, <laughs> the uh, challenging situation we had. So dense yellow bush lupin back in these dunes and up, up on the four dune dense European beach grass. This shows the duff layer that I mentioned that's below. So this area had been weed eated and then it exposes the, the duff layer, which needs to be removed in order to um, return the species to native, the area to native vegetation. This is what a four dune looks like in a native area, the Lanphier dunes. You can see that there's sand moving up towards the top of the dune. And there's also areas where sand is moving over the top of the dune. And this is one of the prerequisites for adaptation to sea level rise. The dune needs to be able to migrate upland as the sea level rises, so inland and up, inland and up in elevation. This is the four dune out on our current site. You can see that it's very badly scarped or cliffed. This happens when we have severe storms. Research that we did over the past six years um, it has shown that uh, native dunes, four dunes vegetated with native species recover much more quick, quickly from this kind of scarping than four dunes vegetated with invasive species, which is another part of their resiliency because in this case, the, this cliff stays there until the next storm and then it just keeps um, retreating. These are our treatments that we um, are applying. The um, blue is heavy equipment where we're going into those really dense European uh, yellow bush lupin areas and using heavy equipment to turn over the sand, bury the, the organic matter and expose mineral sand. The tan areas are manual treatment where we're chopping down the yellow bush lupin and sometimes coyote brush. Um, and then the red is Oh, and we're also doing annual grasses, which are exposed when you take those uh, shrubs off, you see all of the annual grasses. So we're treating those and we're, we're mainly doing weed eating on those right now. And then we have um, the European beach grass areas, which we're planning to um, spray and then burn. So this is my crack team, uh, Jillian Zimmerman on the right and Nicole Matonic on the left. These two are the ones on the ground directing all the crews, working with the heavy equipment. So I can't give them enough um, credit for that. They're doing a great job. This is one of the uh, hand crew to hand tool crews. We have up to five crews at a time out there right now because there's su such a large area. So we've got the CCCs, the American Conservation Experience, RCAA, Samara Restoration, and Matol Restoration Council. So it, it gives those, um, rest, uh, Jillian and Nicole keeps them very busy. Here's an uh, aerial view of one of the crews out. They've been chopping down yellow bush loop and you can see the piles of yellow bush loop and that'll go back and be burned. But now they're having to deal with all the annual grasses. And this is some um, weed eating. They're weed eating around the ferns because we have a very limited amount of time to treat the, the annual grasses before they fruit. So we have to put all of our effort on them and then come back and do the other species. This is uh, someone from our CAA weed eating and then um, in, in many areas, not all, we have to go back then and, and remove the duff layer. And this is done also by hand using the uh, hoe rake. It's piled and then it's shoved into a trench that's, that's dug by a small tractor. Heavy equipment work is the most dramatic. We have 70 acres of it. It was entirely covered in yellow bush lupin. Here you can see the bulldozer 
is digging up, pushing up a trench, and these excavators are pushing the vegetation down into these lower areas that were trenched, and then the the um, dozers come back and cover that with with a meter of clean sand. This is what it looks like after. You can see that they worked around two relic native dune mat areas. We do want to encourage vegetation to reoccur in these areas. And we've, um, we're working with Samara Nursery to grow out plants for us. And um, in addition to that, we will be using sand fencing to um, provide semi-stable environment for the plants to get established. We're also doing monitoring, both baseline and topographic monitoring. Thanks, Andrea. All right, and James Ray. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Great. So my name is James Ray. I'm a senior environmental scientist for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. I work in our coastal conservation team. I'm going to take this even further out of Humboldt Bay um, and talk about the uh, Ocean Ranch Restoration Project, which is actually situated down in the Eel River estuary. So seven minutes is not much time, so let's forge your head. It's almost time for the break. So there are um, several uh, really cool things about this restoration project, and one of them is the scale. So this is a large project. It's 850 acres. It's about 571 acres or so of estuary and tidal marsh restoration and enhancement. And it's about 280 acres or so of uh, coastal dunes. So another super important thing about this project is that it's highly collaborative. You can see the main project partners here, CDFMW, Ducks Unlimited, the We Art Tribe, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, and most recently, uh, Cal Fire. But of course, these are just entities you know, it's really the people who do this work. And I'm not going to show a list of names today because the Ocean Ranch family is super big. There's several people in this room, many people in this room who are part of that. And so we appreciate all of the work that people have done previously. This has been a 10 year design project before it was implemented in 2022. And all of the teams of folks at all levels who are still working on it. So the Ocean Ranch, uh, the Ocean Ranch restoration project is taking place on the Ocean Ranch unit of the Eel River Wildlife Area which is owned and managed by CDFW. I also want to acknowledge our funding partners. You know, these projects simply don't happen without money. And so uh, once you've implemented a project, it's e easy to forget that. Um, but the Coastal Conservancy and these other entities provided funding from the planning phase through to implementation and also some monitoring money as well. So we really appreciate that. So this is a picture of the Eel River Delta. Everything that you can see there in green is the Eel River Wildlife Area, which is about 2,600 acres in total. And what you can see there now highlighted in blue is the Ocean Ranch Unit, which is what we're talking about. It's, of course, important to note that the Ocean Ranch Unit highlighted there in red, um, as well as all of the land that we're standing on right now, is on unceded ancestral lands of the Wiat people. And the Wiat tribe, as I noted, are critical partners for this project. And they're working with us on native vegetation planning and planting, on our fish monitoring, and uh, on uh, interpretive signs that represent biocultural importance of the area. So, um, you know, the Ocean Ranch Unit and its situation in the Eel River estuary, it's where the estuary meets the ocean, meets the dunes, meets um, the bluff. And so ecologically and culturally speaking, it's uh, very important. Um, the primary ecosystems that we're working with are coastal dunes, which you can see highlighted there in yellow, and then estuary and tidal marsh, which you can see highlighted there in blue. Um, the, the natural communities, the native biodiversity, the ecological processes of these important coastal habitats have been severely degraded over time through uh, land use practices such as diking and draining of the land for land reclamation. Uh, and also through extensive invasions of invasive species such as dense flowered cord grass in the marsh and also European beach grass in the dunes. So 
Our fundamental goals for this project are tr to try and reverse that. We want to restore native biodiversity. We want to increase resiliency of these ecosystems to sea level rise and to um, climate change. And then additionally, we also want to improve the access of this place. Not many people really know what Ocean Ranch Unit is. Um, and it's, like I said, a, just an amazing place. And so we want to get the public out there more using it and enjoying it and appreciating its values. So how do we go about achieving those goals? Um, of, let me just go back and just reiterate those goals. So I don't think I actually mentioned them. You can read them, but I do want to say them. Um, you know, for us, this, this is a, a large project. And so we're not trying to nickel and dime specific goals for certain types of species. What we really want to do is get entire processes functioning again. So natural ecological processes and functions back in both the dunes and the estuary. So how do we go about doing that? Well, in the estuary, our primary goal is to restore full tidal exchange, get the full tidal prism back on the landscape. We also want to create some habitat complexity and heterogeneity. And of course, we have to control that invasive Spartina, um, uh, dense flowered cordgrass. And in the dunes, restoring process at our location really means eradicating uh, European beach grass. And then for our public access goals, we've improved the trails. Uh, we've improved parking at this location. As I said, we're working on some cool signs with the Weart tribe that are really going to explain the cultural and ecological significance of this area. And uh, we also created a non-motorized boat launch so you can use the estuary from a, a different mode of transport. So this is just a, I was worried that you weren't gonna be able to see that legend, but this is a ginormous screen, so uh, you can see it. Um, this map is just a sort of schematic that shows what work has been done. In 2022, we implemented our groundwork to try and restore that tidal connectivity. And what that means uh, is lowering of internal levees, breaching of external levees, um, and the excavation of a series of channels all the way through this unit to convey uh, the tidal prism across the landscape. Um, and it also involved, uh, for a habitat perspective, we introduced large wood structures to the site using helicopters. This photo is for Bill Matsubu, if he's still here, likes helicopters. Um, although we didn't get to ride in this one, unfortunately. Um, and we also uh, added some uh, habitat complexity on this site by creating aquatic off-channel habitats at a variety of depths. So you get this mosaic of different habitats that are available to aquatic species across a range of um, seasonal conditions. So alongside um, the hydrology restoration, of course, we have to res um, try and control Spartina dense flora, your, uh, the uh, dense flowered cordgrass. We have an extensive infestation at this site, about 300 acres. And so the site is also diverse um, in its landform and where the, the hydrology of the site works through some of the channels. So it can be difficult to access. So in an attempt to uh, really maximize our effectiveness, we're using an integrated pest management approach uh, where we're using mechanical treatments and then some herbicide treatments. And then we're also experimenting with fire. We've treated about 40 acres in the last two years. And we estimate that in reality, full treatment of this site to get it under control is probably a 10-year endeavor. So pivoting to the dunes, um, again, our goals here are to eradicate European beach grass, to bring back um, native biodiversity, but also to restore uh, processes in the dunes, so natural sand movement. Um, I think Andrea touched on it, but um, European breach grass really locks down the dunes and stabilizes them in an artificial way, which reduces their resiliency to sea level rise and erosion. And again, we're using an integrated pest management approach to deal with this. And that is primarily prescribed fire and some herbicide use, and then also hand removal in some locations where appropriate. Um, we have treated about 45 acres, two minutes. <laughs> Did Ross, didn't Ross get 10? I didn't, know, I didn't know you could put requests in. Um, so we've treated about 45 acres so far, and we think that we're on a sort of a timeline of five to seven years to complete the dunes. So monitoring is a critically important part of every restoration project. You know, it's important to try and evaluate your restoration efforts against um, success criteria that may have been developed. It's also useful for 
um, pointing towards adaptive management that might be required and also informing that adaptive management. And then again, critically important for planning of other future restoration projects from a lessons learned perspective. And so we have a pretty robust monitoring program. We're monitoring the fish community and the water quality throughout the estuary. We're monitoring the vegetation community in both the dunes and the marsh um, in response to that change in hydrology, but also treatment of um, invasive plants. We're monitoring the channel geomorphology to see how those channels uh, evolve over time and see how they function in addition to some of those off-channel habitats that were created. And we're going to start monitoring our dune geomorphology, building on work that Andrea had done previously to see how the dunes respond to the removal of European beach grass. So I'm practically out of time, but I'm going to try and squeak a bit more out of Emily. Um, so I just want to briefly show you, don't worry too much about this graph, but this is, we, we just recently completed our first um, year of annual monitoring. Um, and this is the results. And there's a couple of takeaways here. Firstly, in an, immediately we've seen a really robust fish assemblage. There's 22 species in this assemblage. Uh, it's in this, the kind of assemblage that we'd expect to see in a functioning estuary here on the north coast. But importantly, perhaps more than the species that are in this assemblage, in this assembl assemblage is how they're responding to the, um, the tidal hydrology, the restored process and tidal hydrology in this estuary. So we're seeing them turn up at different times of the year, the times of the year we're expecting, they're responding to changing gradients and salinity and temperature, which are the types of things you see in functioning estuaries. And then to emphasize the point, um, we are seeing extensive use by coho salmon through all habitat types. Almost done, Emily. Um, in all habitat types that were created, and um, we're seeing two different life history types in this estuary as well, which is really important for um, resiliency uh, of uh, populations. So finally, I'll leave you with this. This is a 1979 image of uh, the Ocean Ranch Unit. That yellow circle there is just a, you know, a reference point for your eye. This is what it looks like in 2023 at a similar tide. So we recognize we've got work to do here, particularly with the invasive plants. We recognize this site is going to evolve a little bit and change. But in terms of us being able to get some of those major processes back on this landscape that were absent for a long time, then um, we think we're making progress with that. And as we like to say, thinking about the work that Katie's doing and lots of other folks in this room, um, estuaries are back. Thank you. I'd like to ask our last four speakers if you wouldn't mind coming up to the front and we have a few minutes for questions from the last four speakers. Hello. <laughs> this is a this is a question for Ross Taylor about the. Oh, wait a minute. Is it yes? The Martin Slough enhancement. Um, you mentioned uh, fifteen species of fish, I think, or so that you're seeing, and I'm wondering were any of them invasive species? Um, yeah, we did. We did see some, uh, got one fathead minnow. I have no idea where that came from. And then we had some California roach that are not. And before my work in there, there was one pike minnow that was found in Martin Slough, um, but there's not a population of them in Martin Slough. So most of the fish we were seeing were native estuary marine fish. And just the assemblages, probably that everyone's doing sampling changes as in the wintertime you have lower salinities you see a different assemblage that you do in the summertime when you have almost um, you know 28 to 32 parts per thousand bay water hi you two folks who mentioned herbicides 
please specify what specific herbicides will be used, and do you plan to mon part of your monitoring monitor where the herbicide residues may travel? Uh, we're using imazapir, which is a very low toxic herbicide. It's approved for use and has been used in the past for this purpose, so we're not monitoring residue. Yeah, we're, we're using the same um, like compound of mazapir, and uh, we're not monitoring. It's a uh, very well studied um, years of documentation uh, herbicide, which has been evaluated in numerous uh, EIRs from Washington State to San Francisco Bay to, to the local EIR for the uh, Spartina eradication program. So we're super confident. Um, in the low toxicity of that herbicide, and we are not monitoring its residue in the dunes. Um, however, we are monitoring it uh, in the locations that we use it in the marsh. Hi, I'm curious about the chemicals that the golf course uses and how that impacts the Martin Slough. Um. Is Miles Slattery still here from the city of Eureka? I'm not um, totally positive with the applications on the golf course. 